Louis Crane was born on the 6th of January 1957 in Los Angeles, California. He grew up in a family home and was the third out of four siblings. His family were quite poor and lived in a very rundown area of California. He attended school, but it was reported that Crane had some level of learning disabilities and scored a very meagre 69 on his IQ test. In the 1970s, while he was still only a teenager, Crane left his family home. He started his young life as a street person. He had no fixed address and no job or money. And this was a vicious cycle for many. With no address for a job, he had to find a way that he could to make some money. So he spent some time begging and eventually picked up some casual manual labor which managed to keep food in his belly. A start in life that you wouldn't wish for anyone. In May 1987, a 29-year-old woman by the name of Carolyn Barney was killed. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. She was a prostitute at the time of her murder. LA had been in the news lots in the late 1980s, as it was a very tough time for street workers. Many had been murdered and there were talks of a serial killer preying on them, using them as a means to satisfy their murdering intent. Feeling that they would not be missed by family, so the police would not spend a lot of time looking for the killer. But this was not the case. A specific task force had been active for a while. Carolyn was yet another victim of who the police were calling the Southside Slayer. She was found very close to where her parents lived and very close to a house belonging to a man named Roger Crane. He was in fact Louis Crane's brother. While police had the area covered, when they were dealing with the suspicious murder, they noticed a man behaving oddly around the cordon they had set up. This man was Louis Crane. He was arrested there and then and he was taken to the local police station where he was questioned at length. While he was in custody, he confessed to the killing of Carolyn and shockingly, he went on to confess to other murders in addition to Carolyn's. He had told police the story about Carolyn. He went on to state that he and his brother Roger had paid her for sex and during this time, Roger had strangled her he stated that they were both scared of what had happened and dumped her body, hoping she wouldn't be found and linked to them. And that this was the reason for his behavior at the scene. Roger was then brought in for questioning regarding these serious allegations made by his brother. But he was able to prove with rock solid alibis that he was not anywhere near Carolyn or even his own brother at the time of her murder. Family members also fought to save Roger from this torrent of lies brought to him by his own brother. Luckily, the lies were seen through and Roger was released without charge. However, the same could not be said for Louis. He had been held on the suspicion of one of the Southside Slayer murders. By this time, a few other people had been linked to some of the murders of this apparent one serial killer and the police were now looking at them all as individual murders, mostly due to the fact that other men had been charged with some of the many murders of prostitutes and street workers committed in the 1980s. Crane had now spent some time in custody on the charge of first degree murder. And while being questioned subsequently, he admitted to the murders of Loretta Perry, who was also strangled. She was found in late January, and also Vivian Collins, who was killed mid-March of the same year. All of these women had been strangled and sexually assaulted, and all by Crane. Now Crane was being held on three counts of first degree murder, but this was not all of Crane's victims. His list was about to increase. Two further murders of women who were not linked to the Southside Slayer, 
were also brought to Crane. These were of Gail Ficklin and Sheila Burton. These ladies had been killed much before the other three, but it was the location that called police to ask Crane about them. The place and the victim type were all very similar. All of these victims were young women and all were left dumped in close proximity to Crane's parental home. Crane's belongings were searched and a bloodstained shirt was found in his possession. This was taken to be tested and used as evidence when sentencing this vicious man. Police spent time getting testimonies from family members who all spoke about how fed up of Crane's ways they were. They told police of his aggressive nature and how they were worried that something would happen which would involve him and a woman. But they could never believe it would be multiple murders. They even opened up to how they had seen him behave towards women, especially prostitutes. He had seemed to despise them. His own mother even made a statement to the police saying that she had seen her son wear the evidential shirt with the blood down it on the night of the murder that he blamed his brother for. The case against Crane, which was looking watertight, was set to begin in 1989. But this was now the second trial. The first had been set as a mistrial due to the fact that evidence which was used in court had not been properly logged as evidence. The defence team acting for Crane spent a long time riling the police for questioning him for so long, knowing that he was intellectually impaired. They stated that his confessions counted for nothing due to this. They used the fact that he had been held for too long without representation. The only case the defence had was to negate the police actions rather than defend their clients. The court was shown the shirt, which Crane denied to own. They were told about his mother's testimony about seeing him wear that exact shirt, to which the defence argued the shirt was worn by Crane, but the blood was his from a recent nosebleed. But the DNA rebuked that fact by showing the blood type to be different from his own and in fact, the same as one of the victims. Loretta Perry's case came into evidence. At first, her death was put down to an accidental overdose, as she was an avid drug user. But when her body was exhumed after Craig's admission to her murder, his claims were sought to be true, and she was in fact strangled by him. Crane was put in the witness stand in the court in Compton. The court was not full of victims' family or family in support of the defendant. In fact, the court was surprisingly empty for a big case, which was not void from news for too long. He was asked why he thought his family would testify against him. He replied that they were angry at him for leaving the family home so young to go and live on the streets. He made nasty comments about them in court for all to hear. They asked why he admitted to all of the murders while in police custody. He simply replied that it was what the police wanted to hear and thinking if he said what they wanted, it would all be over. He was asked if he was an innocent man being accused of something he hadn't done and he replied, that's the way it is. After all of the evidence was presented and the arguments for and against, on the 16th of May 1989, nearly two years after his arrest, Crane was finally charged with four counts of first-degree murder. He was aged just 31. He was in the presence of his son and the mother of his son, which was very rare in this court case. They came to hear his sentencing. Judge Janice Croft sent the jury away to decide Crane's fate. They had a choice of life imprisonment or the death penalty. And on the 6th of June 1989, the court decided the only punishment available for a man this terrible 
had to be the death penalty. He was transferred from his current prison to the notorious San Quentin prison, where he remained on death row until the 3rd of November 1989, where he was taken to a prison hospital near San Rafael, where he died of AIDS-related complications, an illness he had had for a long time. He ended up serving only a few months on death row. Many of the authorities feel that the murders assigned to Crane were not his only victims. They believe he could have many more to his name. We will never know for sure how many. Thank you so much for your continued support. Feel free to leave a comment as we enjoy reading them. If you like the video, please hit the like button and subscribe if you want to hear more stories from Crime Busters.